I think actually if you had to describe the one thing that has never changed about this organization, it has been the commitment, it has been the passion, it has been the ability to understand what our clients require. It's phenomenal. I'm not exactly sure how they hire here, but it's, I can never do their job. Kool-Aid has a mission to end homelessness by working in partnership with others to find solutions that will work for the whole community. You know, we've been around a long time, and yet we're still growing. We're still looking at the services that are needed. We have the courage to change. We operate with a lot of compassion, a lot of understanding, a lot of patience, and we're in for the long haul. It's a very exciting time to be working in the field, and I think for Kool-Aid, the next 10 years might show some, some significant change. And yet again, I have to say, you know, it's a sad story, our growth. It just shows how the ills of society have grown. I sincerely hope that we don't need emergency shelters for homeless people in 40 years from now. I sincerely hope that Kool-Aid will still be uh, in business, operating supportive housing uh, programs that will contain people who need homes rather than temporary shelters. That's my only hope. You know, the whole, the whole organization, uh, as I mentioned at the first, it was Cool Aid meaning Hip Help, was simply a youth hostel. And really the service consisted of somebody's living room and a telephone. If you were hitchhiking around and had no place to stay, you could basically crash in this living room. And I believe the rules were no sex, no drugs, no booze, two nights at a time, and if you can, contribute 25 cents. Well, we had the naive sense that oh, everybody on the planet was a human being and they all deserved some kind of respect. You know, it's like, I don't know, maybe we were completely wacky. <laughs> After a year or two of that, they actually moved to um, a part of the Belfry Theatre over in Fernwood. They had 20 beds at the time. They had minimal staffing. Uh, they provided what meals they could. This is pretty much soup for folks. Certainly in the 70s when, when Kool-Aid uh, had a hostel for youth, they, it became very clear very, very early on that in fact the youth were coming and the backpackers were coming into, into Victoria and they needed some health services. Basically the programs were the clinic. We had a dental clinic, so we had a medical clinic and a dental clinic. And then we had the hostel. Basically just wanted to provide a youth organization run by youth for youth that would meet the needs of the folks that were traveling and wanted to experience the world. They felt that was very important at the time. In those days it was a little different. Uh, there was a, a mixture of things going on. Uh, we would let people in during the summer months uh, for all the travelers and whatnot. And then in the winter it would change to um, uh, people that were basically homeless. I mean, we didn't even call people homeless in those days. They were just folks that were out on the street with problems, you know, and we were providing them with some shelter and food. Everyone knew each other really well, knew what to expect from each other, that kind of thing because when you work together for those kind of lengths of time and shifts, everyone knew when to step in and when to back off. In those days, I think it was, it was fairly innovative to sort of form relationships with those people and, and gain trust with them. We would uh, be in the front desk uh, area that had a kind of a box around it, but it was opened around the top. So Mike and I would sit in the office and crumple up bits of paper and try and toss it over the top of the office and into a garbage can. And a lot of the residents that were there on a, on a regular basis would watch that going on and sort of start cheering for us and then get involved and then they'd want to try it. You really have to work hard at, at maintaining those strong relationships with the people that you're serving, I think, is the key. If we can attract quality people who will change slightly, alter Kool-Aid, but maintain the heart, I think we're going to be in good stead in another 40 years.
unfortunately with the need for longer stays becoming more and more apparent, clients shifted from traveling youth to folks that were here living in town, living in our community, but were um, unable to find or keep housing. It turned out as we went through the 70s that many of those folks had more, uh, more and more challenging medical needs. There were folks that just simply did not have doctors, did not have an ability to get medical attention. We started at that point talking about the cycle of evictions. People are coming into the shelter, we're seeing the same folks over and over and over. They'd come, they'd stay maybe a month or two, find a place to live, and then a month or two later, they're back in the shelter. The difference between an emergency shelter for the homeless and trying to create permanent housing, uh, your, man, your mandates are, are completely different, actually. In the shelter, you're trying to support people, you're trying, you're feeding them, clothing them, and you want them to move on as quick, quickly as possible to make room for somebody else who needs that service. In the housing program, you're doing the exact opposite. You're trying to receive people. Yes, you want to help them. You want to introduce them to resources. And you want them to believe that they've come to a place that they can call home. As you can see from this shelter, it's certainly not a home. We have to have rules because we have 100 people in the building. So we have to have people up at a certain time. We have to clean at a certain time. By nature, it's a bit institutional. Um, we need to be the gateway and the door to mental health services, to addiction services, to medical services, to employment-related services, to housing. There is a woman that comes to mind named Audrey, 76 years old, showed up on our doorstep. We weren't sure what was going on with her. Turned out we were dealing with age, we were dealing with some dementia, we were dealing with a variety of things. Uh, we needed to get her to see a medical practitioner, we needed to address her mental health issues, we needed to get her to the point where we could get a public trustee appointed to help manage her funds. The short story is it took a year and a half, but she is in a situation now where she can live out the rest of her days with the adequate supports that are necessary. I mean, if we just stayed with temporary shelter, we were just um, doing a revolving door and we weren't able to make lasting change for anybody. So it was symbolic of getting our first housing project where we could take off from there and we did. We are currently managing eight building sites all over Greater Victoria. I'll start with Swift House, which is the, our first housing project over Street Link, the emergency shelter. We have 26 units there. We had done the Swift. We then shown with Pandora Project, so it wasn't a one-off. We have the Pandora Project and uh, we have 32 units of housing at that site. We also have eight transitional youth units on the ground floor. Uh, we have the Downtown Community Activity Centre also contained within that building. Then with Micah Dora, that was a totally different kind of process where we were doing it without government funding to a large degree. We have 45 units of supportive housing in that building. So with the help of BC Housing, uh, we received funding to turn the Micadora building into the same model as Swift House and Pandora. And we were now getting a model, sort of getting a process going. So after that, we even had things like Van City, Coast Capital, we had the Real Estate Foundation of British Columbia now aware of of how we can do things. So every time we build a building now and we say we make promises and we're going to do this and we're going to do that, they're confident that that's actually how, what we're going to do. There's a huge need out there for the type of housing that we're trying to build. For the first time in my experience with the shelters anyways and with Kool-Aid, there's getting to be a little bit of hope. There's getting to be um, a renewed sense that it actually might be possible to reduce homelessness. It might actually be possible to make some dent in this. Some of the cities in the states that have been three years and four years now into 10-year plans are actually seeing reductions in their street populations. I know that Montreal is reducing their shelter beds and um, converting them into housing units. And so there's, there's a spark of hope. There's, there, there's possibilities are coming up. Mind you, I believe Montreal built something like 10,000 housing units, so we do have some catching up to do. We've designed and built eight buildings, um, most of which are housing, but we've got our activity center and, and other buildings. So um, Hillside Terrace and Fairway Woods are our newest buildings. And each of those buildings we've learned a little bit more. The model that I was introduced to was a hierarchical model. John's here in the office, he's you had a problem, come to John, John will help you deal with the problem or he'll fix it. 
Uh, it's a model that I've since learned does not work. And that's when I noticed I got up one morning and had a bit of an epiphany and realized, wait a minute, hold it here. I've got 26 helpers here. It isn't just me, it's us. It's the, the people who are involved in this community, whether you're a tenant, whether you're a staff. And I remember going to work that day with a whole new idea of what this uh, program was about. Kool-Aid couldn't be in a position it is today if you hadn't had that whole process of success, of, of, of being an organization that people, you're solid, you're reliable, and you know if you go to Kool-Aid to get something done, it'll get done. Well, essentially, Next Steps is to try and better serve the needs of the folks uh, that we see at the shelters that will only use us once or intermittently. So Next Steps is a, is a try at putting more, of, more resources into people sooner when they reach the shelter uh, to try and get them out into permanent housing. We're in the, on the second floor here of the Next Steps shelter. We have a three-bedroom, another three-bedroom, and there's a two-bedroom and a two-bedroom, so it works out to ten beds on this floor. Um, there's one bathroom up here, and this is uh, the male bathroom. The bookshelf here, this was set up by Project Literacy. Uh, one of the aims we had of this kind of environment, too, was to input lots of community programming into the house while people are here, as well as help them facilitate their own care plans and goals. So we have Project Literacy, street nurses, um, supports like that coming in on a regular basis. I think what makes Next Steps unique in shelters is the fact that we are a small shelter and with really good staff to client ratio. And what that allows us to do is spend a lot more one on one time with clients and search out a lot more of the, the unique supports that they require. And you're not going to get that time in a, in a larger ratio of staff to client that you have in larger shelters. Also what works here is that we're very kind of open-ended on the length of the stay. We have a lot more time to, to set those supports in place. Clients have to be in a pretty stable frame of mind to come here. They can't be using any substances while they're here. They need to have some basic supports in place and to have started working on a plan to show that they're ready to move on to the next step. I think just bringing the fact that our homeless are our homeless um, population and we have not only an obligation to do something about it and it's not only the right thing to do something about it and we would not only want it to be done if it was us in those shoes but economically it just makes more sense and uh, that, that part has probably changed in the last eight years or so is the sense that uh, people are realizing that it's, it's actually cheaper to do the right thing than it is to continue to do what we've been doing. We uh, are really not interested in um, designing more shelters and building larger shelters. Ironically, we are doing that because we have too many people in this existing building and we want to do better with the people and we want to reduce the time that people stay in shelters, but that means we have to have those other resources available. You have to have housing to move to uh, out of the shelters, so the solution to homelessness is homes, not shelters, but every community is always going to have a shelter because things happen. At best, shelters would be a very short-term stay where you can access the resources to get your life stabilized quickly. Well, I was on the streets for the last couple of weeks and that's when I really fell down hard and they got me back in here so I don't have to be on the street anymore. So and they're encouraging me to, uh, to get help that I need. So I went and got all the paperwork done today and they're helping me out, giving me a place to stay, even though I, I'm, I, I'm on my two weeks out now, they, gave, they let me back in here, so I'm not on the streets, so they're helping a lot. A 
I've been on my own since I was about 12 years old. Mm -hmm. My parents were deceased, and I came out from Newfoundland to the East Coast, or West Coast here, and I've been living in Vancouver for 25 years since I was 16, and I was on the streets in Vancouver. And I moved to Victoria about seven years ago. The past six months, I've been at two hostels, and I've been over here at Streetlink, and it's good, it's a good experience for me. It's a humbling experience. It is a sanctuary, it's good, you're, you're fed, you can, you, you can clean yourself up. One, one day the staff might be dealing, one hour they might be dealing with people that have been through the mental institutions and stuff. Next thing they might be dealing with a guy from the street. And so I mean, I'm not exactly sure how they hire here, but it's, I could never do their job. I do, I, I do actually praise them for being strong enough to try to do the job. stats today are still roughly true then that about a third of the folks that we see through the shelter system will use us once and then they'll move on and we're likely to never see them again it was uh, simply a blip in their lives it was you know, a short period of time where they needed to stay with us there's another third of the folks that we see that we might see two or three times we might see for a while and then they'll go away for a few months and that might not work out and we'll see again and we might see them a couple of times over the course of a year and a half then there's a smaller percentage of folks, and they're folks that, um, well, we consider them our Gold Club members. Um, there's folks that we will see for probably a huge chunk of time. If, we're, if we do our job well, and if they work with us, and we're lucky, we'll get them into a supported permanent housing situation that will work well for them. I mean, I ended up here through, you know, my own fault. I got evicted from um, um, uh, low-income housing, and it came at just the, the worst time possible. I I just needed to decompress, and uh, in being in this atmosphere all the time, you just you go start going a little crazy. And I'm bipolar too, so, and uh, I don't take any medication for it. So I've been going through kind of a manic stage the last few days. Um, like a chicken with his head cut off, running around like crazy. But I'm really looking forward to uh, moving into this, this house and getting away from here. According to our last homelessness count, we counted about 1,200 and 50 people um, absolutely homeless. So 1,500 units would pretty much solve homelessness in our community. 1,500 units with, ad with adequate supports. That's not a big deal. That should be readily achievable. That should be a percentage of the next 15 buildings that are built, perhaps. There's a variety of ways that we can do this quite quickly. It's more the will, and it's more the awareness it's more people seeing that their tax dollars can be better spent. Instead of just maintaining homelessness, it can, they can be better spent on actually solving homelessness. I stayed in the shelter at Streetlink for about three months. If there wasn't programs around like Kool-Aid and Victoria, I never would have made it in this city. Uh, also, Reese, I've used for support. They got all kinds of resources here. There's no end to it. And if it weren't for Kool-Aid's resources, then I wouldn't have made it here. Today I got my own place. Uh, they've assisted with that. To no end, they've helped me out. That's, uh, that's my involvement with Kool-Aid. <laughs> I've even signed up to give a little bit back. I'm gonna sign up for a mentoring project here to help mentor, volunteer. So that'll tell you a little bit about my appreciation towards their programs and what they're doing.
REIS stands for Resources, Employment, Education and Support, and the services have been around since uh, 1998 for 10 years now, and it's essentially a resource for people uh, facing challenges with their mental health and addictions. We provide a range of services for people, uh, outreach and case management, including um, an employment service. And we're non-profit. We take none of the money. The employers pay the workers directly. Whatever the wage is negotiated with the employer, that completely goes to the worker. We don't take any fees out. So that's a substantial difference. There's some for-profit businesses in town that also do employment referrals, but you know they're charging the employer a premium and paying the worker a, a, a real minimal wage. Uh, we're a very unique service in, in BC. Outreach program is done through here as well, so we have a team of two outreach workers who um, really provide regular outreach and case management to sort of support to people who are dealing with complex issues. Hi, Larry. How are you doing? We essentially either provide you know, basic crisis support when they're in a crisis, and for a number of them, they sort of require assistance to coordinate all the services in their lives and to move forward so our outreach workers are available to them to help coordinate that. Uh, generally the people do come into the office and uh, they sort of uh, ask them what they want and oh you want an outreach worker so what happens is they call downstairs to our office and say we've got this person here that needs some help with something do you have any time and generally we we can get to see them on the same day. The program has helped a lot, probably, probably a lot more than uh, than actual formal therapy. This is more, this is more human. Uh, just sitting talking to someone, someone you trust, and someone that you know is there to help you. Well, this is uh, 713 Johnson Street. It was a building that we purchased with our partners AIDS Vancouver Island back in uh, late 2005. Uh, and the vision for this building is that it's going to become the Access Health Centre and it's going to bring Kool-Aid's Community Health Clinic um, and Dental Clinic over here and they're going to occupy the first and second floors of this building. AIDS Vancouver Island is going to bring its uh, local programs and services into the top floor, which is this floor right here that we're standing in now. Kool-Aid is a service provider and now we're entering into a period where we have to ask folks out in the community for their financial assistance in making this building a reality. Our community health services are, are so vital because health supports for people that are vulnerable and at risk are, are hugely important to making sure that they can maintain their housing once they, once they get it. And I think we're going to see more and more of this in this community as nonprofits have to figure out how they're going to best use their, their resources. So for me, first of all, it represents a partnership between two organizations. Uh, second, it also gives us something that we've been uh, looking for for a number of years, and that's to be able to move into a centre which allows us to provide a greater range of services, more services and more often. So the current health centre down on Store Street is busting at the seams. This is the solution to that. You can see that we're cr absolutely bursting at the seams and we, have, we need to have more space so we don't have to juggle for examining room space. If you can put as many services, health services as possible under one roof, then you're going to be able to see people uh, as, as a whole. I think that our clients deserve to have the very best. We need to have privacy and clients who feel respected and listened to. We have folks that are on the street that we are, have not housed yet. Uh, the street is extremely hard on your body. Um, we're trying to keep those people as healthy as possible and alive until we can get them into actual housing. And so um, the health services are absolutely critical. Since the beginning of Kool-Aid, you've talked about the whole 40th anniversary. Uh, through the years, very important, pivotal, bright people have played a role every step of the way. And it's no one person who can claim, you know, I, 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 it was us, us, us. 
So thank you everyone for coming to celebrate with us. It is our 40th anniversary and we're really happy to be sharing it with a larger community. I never would have believed 40 years down the road having the privilege of working for Kool-Aid. Uh, it's been an amazing journey. Hello everybody. We're a little band from Victoria, BC. We'd like to thank everybody from the Kool-Aid Society for having us here today. And we're called Zola Bud. And the song's called Please Victoria. This 40 year uh, celebration uh, will help people understand that there's uh, you know, a large group of people in our community that are kind of dedicated to trying to resolve these problems. When I'm walking down Johnson Street, got a hold of the Bible. I know how I survive is I get up in the morning and I come to work and I just do the best job I possibly can. It's the only message I hope my colleagues uh, understand. When you lose your heart, you've lost it all. So I think we've maintained that heart and we're not going to stop until we end homelessness. Take me, cleanse me, hold me please Victoria, save me from eternity. Take me, cleanse me, hold me, please, Victoria. 